Well, good morning. Good morning. Oh, okay. Let's try that one again. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you. Uh, whether you're in the building today or uh, whether you're watching us online, all of you are welcome. Um, after the, the service, we're going to have uh, tea and coffee in the Pillar Hall, which is the area that you've uh, come through to get into uh, the building this morning. Uh, for those of you who are visiting, just to let you know that uh, uh, normally if uh, we're able, we stand to sing and we sit uh, to pray. There's not an offering taken during the service, uh, but there is a, a card machine uh, and a space if you would like to uh, use that or uh, leave cash as uh, a donation towards the work of the church. But there is no requirement for you to do that. Um, Elaine is going to share a couple of things. I have two notices today. Um, the first is about the Afternoon Fellowship Canal Boat Trip, a week on Tuesday. This is open to anyone. We have still some spaces on the barge. It costs £14, um, a two-hour barge trip and a picnic tea as well. There is a sign-up sheet on the communion table at the back of the Pillar Hall. If you'd like more information, see me in the Pillar Hall or speak to Jean McCauley afterwards. But the other one is about the learning community. Most of you will have received the MailChimp and it's had information for a few weeks for about a learning community. Those who've been around a while will know what it is, but we have a number of new folks who might be saying, uh, what's that? Basically, we come together and we learn from each other. We have a number of teams who carry out ministry in the church and a number of teams who carry out mission in the church and some people do both and we'll leap so we come together saturday morning the 24th of june to learn from each other and to plan ahead so if you're not part of the mission or ministry of the church so far we invite you to come and join us and find out where your gifts might lie don't just leave it to everybody else because we're all in this together we're all called to serve. If you'd like to sign up, please email the church office. The address is on the MailChimp, admin at barclaybeaufort.org.uk. And you have to sign up by, I can't remember the date we said, the 15th, by the 15th. Because if there are not enough people interested, then we're not going to go ahead. But we hope you will be interested. So we expect lots of emails coming in this week. Thank you. And... Uh, just two more things please if you three more things if you um are not signed up for the newsletter please do that because there's uh, lots of information uh, on there you find that on our uh, website um which is barkthebeautiful.org.uk next week is the meadows festival and we have um just received our lovely uh, new maps so in the front is the picture of the church inside when you open it there's um, writing and looking, write down five things that you're thankful for, and then there's a little, how many dogs and cats and things can you see on, on the oversight? There's what's on at church, then there's acts of kindness to do, and things uh, about the building. And then when we open it up, it's our parish, our current parish, because um, in a wee while it'll be a different parish altogether. But at the moment, it's our current parish. And these are for colouring in, they're for using at the Meadows Festival. Uh, and uh, we're going to give them away and uh, encourage uh, anybody who wants to colour one in, but mainly children, I suspect, uh, to, um, to take one away um, just to introduce the church. But that means that we need people to be there on Saturday and Sunday uh, next week. And um, we did put out a little doodle poll this week asking people to let us know if you were free even for an hour or so uh, on Saturday or Sunday. 10 non-staff members um, completed the poll. It is just enough to do both days, just enough um, to, to do that. And so if you didn't see, I'm not going to say if you didn't read the newsletter, but if you didn't see the newsletter this week, or you're thinking, oh, well, I'm not really sure, there's still time to sign up. You can let us know even after the service if you are able to, to be there because the, the whole point is that we want to be able to do that kind of stuff and to, to talk to children and, and, and parents who are there. But we also need people to say, come on in and see what we're doing. So, so we need probably four people for those two days. 
So if you are free, please come and help us. And also, we are struggling a little bit for leaders for, uh, for Holiday Club, which is from the 31st of July uh, to the 4th of August. Because some people might need to be uh, put through the PVG scheme if you've not been done already, today is the last day to volunteer for that. And if we don't have enough people today, then we're going to just say we can't do it this year and we will aim for next year. Because uh, there's, there's no point in struggling on uh, with, with knowing that we don't have quite enough people uh, to, to do it. We, we need people who are going to do the upfront stuff um, and we need people who will be working away in the background, <laughs> doing admin as people come in and getting people registered and all of that kind of stuff. So, so there's a whole variety of roles in there. Uh, and if you think that you could help us, then please uh, speak to either uh, myself uh, or to Ray. Where is Ray? Ray, give us a wave. That's Ray. If you don't know Ray, she's our youth worker. Uh, then speak to, uh, to one of us and let us know uh, if, you're, if you're able to, to help. And there's a meeting uh, on Zoom this Thursday where we're hoping to be able to say we've got enough people and to give out roles uh, for uh, the, the upfront stuff. Sometimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes I find myself thinking, is that it? I got a new phone recently on my contract. Oh, I was so excited about new phone. Because when you went online, they told you all of the wonderful things that you could do with the new phone. And when it came, I thought, is that it? Right? I don't do, I, I make phone calls, right? That, that's what I do with a phone. I take the odd picture. I don't need fancy messaging. I don't, I, you know, I like, I like to be able to, to dial it, and that's it. So all of the other fancy stuff is lost on me, really. So is that it? If I'm honest, sometimes being in church or being at a conference or being somewhere makes me think, is that it? And so this first song that we're going to sing this morning starts with that, and it's a, it's a big it's a big thing. There must be more than this. There must be more than this. Is this it? And it's a prayer. It says, God, you know, here I am. Use me. Fill me. Be more than just this. Consuming fire.
Let's pray together. Father, we remember uh, this day with awe and with wonder, the events of that day of Pentecost long ago, a day that transformed the lives of the apostles. And we ask that you would move in us this day. We remember how in the space of a few moments their experience was revolutionized, their expectations were turned upside down, their attitudes changed forever. One moment consumed by fear, the next radiating confidence. One moment uncertain of the future, and the next sure of their calling to be fishers of people. One moment wrestling with doubt, the next full of faith. One moment hiding behind locked doors, and the next preaching boldly to the crowds. Father, you came through your Spirit, and life was never the same again. Come to us, breathing new fire into our hearts, new energy into our lives, new life into our souls. Transform our fear, anxiety, and doubt. Fill us with confidence and faith. Would you open our minds to new horizons, to new experiences, a new way of looking at life, and give us the sense of, of dissatisfaction that says there must be more than this, a dissatisfaction that draws us ever to you, longing for a deeper, fuller, more intimate relationship with you. Living God, although we rejoice again today at the gift of your Spirit, the way you breathe new hope, new faith, and new life into your people, we also remember that not everyone responded so gladly to the Spirit's coming. For some, there was scorn and ridicule, disbelief, suggestions that the apostles were drunk or even out of their minds. Living God, forgive us that we too can be guilty of a similar response. Instead of welcoming the Spirit, we greet Him with cautious and suspicious hearts. Instead of opening ourselves to the Spirit's movement, we close our hearts and our minds to anything that challenges our long-held preconceptions. Instead of gladly receiving your Spirit's gifts, we barricade our souls against change. Loving God, you warn us to test what we think is the Spirit and to ensure it is of you. There are times when we need to do that, when it's right to be aware of misplaced enthusiasm and false prophecy, but save us from ever quenching or obstructing or frustrating your Holy Spirit. Forgive us for any times that we've done that and help us to open ourselves to you now to receive your Spirit's life-giving breath so that we might live more truly as your people. Be with us today to encourage, <coughs> enable, and empower. And as we say together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, our prayer is for more signs of your kingdom in this place, in our lives, and in our community. And we say together, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. John, can we go back to the photo that I forgot a moment ago? We had a little team of people representing the church who were running uh, the, the 10K, uh, and they were raising funds uh, for the International Justice Mission. There they are. I'm not sure whether that was at the beginning or at the end, but if it was the end, they're looking pretty good. Yeah. It was the end. Oh, excellent. There you go. So you could have really been doing the whole marathon. Look at you. You're looking really fit and, and up for it there. Maybe next year. However, so far... So far, they have managed to raise £772. And the link is still active. So if you want to uh, make a donation still, 
then we can get you that link, or you can just give them the cash, um, and they will add that to uh, the total. But well done uh, to all of you who were involved uh, in that. Uh, uh, Jenny is going to do a reading, and Andrew is going to speak after that. When the day of Pentecost come, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a foul and wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be the tongues of fire and separated, that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard about this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hear them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonder of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does that mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Uh, Jenny, thank you very much. I'm very glad I didn't have to read all those place names uh, in that particular talk. Uh, so there's a lot in that story, okay, kids, because we were fire, there were loads of places and people, uh, and there were different languages, and there was a Holy Spirit. Uh, now, John Cool said we've got about 30 minutes for this bit of the service, okay? So we're going to cover all of that, uh, and we'll go through it in a bit of detail. But to start with Naomi, I need your help, because last week, Kirstein was, Naomi's panicking right now, last week, Kirstein was talking to us about how God's message goes throughout the world. And one of the things uh, that Kirsten said was how many languages are in the world. And you knew the answer to that, Naomi. So, a week later, do you remember how many languages there are in the whole world? Go on. 7,117. That sounds about right to me. Kirsten's nodding to that. Now, that's a lot of languages. Well done, Naomi. That's impressive. (laughs) So as we've got 30 minutes, we can cover most of those 7,000 in this section. Now, I think we could get not 7,000 languages from everyone here, um, but we could probably get a reasonable number of that. So some of you will be doing other languages at school. So obviously, you all know how to speak English. Uh, Does anyone know how to say hello in French? Has anyone done that at school? Joel? Bonjour. Okay. How about Spanish? Anyone done Spanish at school who wants to say hello? Kirsty, do you know Spanish? Yeah. Hola. Yeah, well done, Kirsty. So uh, you can say hola is Spanish. What about German? Does anyone know how to say anything in German? Yeah, go on, Connie. Hello, is that work in German as well? Good job. Okay, I, I was going to go for Guten Tag. Elsa, what do you think? Guten Tag as well, but there's more than one. So in Spanish, you can say salut as well. Uh, as well. So Guten Tag. Or hello. There's three different ways of saying hello in French. Okay, so it turns out there's three different ways. Um, what else? That's Ger- Italian. Anyone want to have a go at Italian? Any Italian? Go on, Elsa. Oh, Elsa has decided that three French might be enough. Okay. Yeah, go on, Joel. Ciao, actually, ciao might be, ciao's definitely goodbye in Italian, you're right. Now, I know there's people here that can speak loads of French. Like, actually, there's people here in this church who can speak French fluently. There's people here who can speak English fluently. In fact, I think 
put your hand up, anyone in the church, adults as well, if uh, you can speak a different language. I promise I'm not going to ask you to say anything. But if you can speak a different language, you know, reasonably well, could you put your hand up? Yeah, so actually, you look around. That's quite a lot of people in this church. Just these people here, and I bet if we're online, there'd be more people as well uh, that can speak different languages. Now, this story was about the time when Jerusalem was really busy. There was loads of people from all over the world in Jerusalem. Uh, And Edinburgh's quite busy this weekend. There is people here for the Edinburgh Marathon. There's loads of people come over. Uh, there's some big, big concerts at Murrayfield. There's been people coming from all over the world to concerts at Murrayfield. Uh, the church has had these big meetings all week in Edinburgh, so it's been quite busy for that. And one of the things that's quite hard when there's somewhere busy and there's people from different countries and languages is you don't always understand each other. So how do you, so there's some people here that are amazing. They can speak French fluently or Spanish or, or other languages. That's incredible. Mary Ann, my wife, speaks Spanish fluently. So when we go on holiday to countries where they speak Spanish, it's great because she can do all the talking, which is really helpful. Makes me a bit lazy, but it's really helpful. But how do you explain God's message when you don't speak the language? Maybe you speak one language, or maybe you're really good and you speak two or three languages. But how do you speak eight languages or ten? Think of all of the names that Jenny read out in that story, all the different places and countries, all of them speaking different languages. How do you share a message of God with all those different languages? And that's what the story is about. It's about God coming through the Holy Spirit to fill the disciples at this really special time of Pentecost and helping them to share God's message. Now, that was a very special time in the Bible. Whether it will happen again in some way, we don't know. But the story is about God's Spirit coming. And we've spoken about God's Spirit coming a few times over the last few weeks. And one of the ways I think about God's Spirit is a bit like, it's a bit like a light in us. Because one of the things we're told in the Bible is God says that we should try and be the light of the world. So when it's dark, you know, it's very bright in here today, we should try and be the light of the world. So, I do not have chocolate in this Cadbury's bag, which I know is disappointing. I know that the group that I am uh, usually with get very excited when we have sweets. I have two torches, okay? Two lights. And the question is, which of these is brighter? Okay? Okay, David, do you think the black one? You think this one is brighter, okay? Yeah, yeah? I know, I think if I turn it on, well, I will, I promise. We're going to turn it on. In fact, you could maybe help me in a second, okay? So, if you like David, if you think this is a brighter one, hands up. Okay? Okay? What about this one? If you think this is a brighter one? Okay, actually, it's a reasonably even split. All right. David, do you want to come turn this one on for me? Okay, now make sure you close your eyes so you don't hurt them. Right, David, David, what's, what's happening? <laughs> David? What's, what, David, what's happened? Where's the light? Nothing's going on. Nothing's going on. No batteries. Oh, there's no batteries inside. Do you want, well, try turning that one on and I'll check for the batteries, okay? All right. Try, is there a button? This one, no, no, don't, this one's just got a button. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if you unscrew it, it's not going to work. <laughs> okay, right, that one, right, hold that one up, hold it up as high as you can. Right, that one does work. David, what's the problem with this one? No. No batteries in this one. So, if we can stretch the metaphor a little and think of the Holy Spirit like a battery, okay? So, go and be the light of the world. It's pretty hard to be the light of the world if you're not, got, you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. It's pretty hard to share God's message, whatever languages you speak, if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. And you can look amazing. Maybe you look like you know all the right stuff, and you've been at every day of General Assembly, and you know your theology, but are you filled? Do you have your batteries? Are you shining like the light? Or maybe you're just an innocent-looking light that doesn't look that good, but look at that and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, your batteries are full, and you can light up the world. David, thank you very much. Can I get my light back? Now, without any planning whatsoever, we're now genuinely going to sing a song about lights and worlds. So I will hand over to the musicians. Thank you very much. We're going to sing together this little light of mine, followed by Restore, O Lord.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, hear our prayer. God, we are wasting your world, hurting and destroying your beautiful creation. Selfish, greedy, and brutal behavior bring poverty, injustice, and fear to so many of the world's citizens. We pray for peace to be restored in war-torn countries. Your comfort and your healing is needed, Lord. Please be with those who suffer and with those who work so hard to alleviate that suffering. Protect them all and fill them with your wisdom and grace to remain strong and sure in the face of adversity. Fill us all with your spirit, Lord. Enable us with your power to help in any way we can those in trouble those hurting and grieving. May they experience your deep care and compassion. Father, we ask you to be with all those who are helping at the Meadows Festival. Fill them with joy and nurture them as they seek to share Jesus' love. We pray that many will be receptive to free hugs and the opportunity to listen and to chat, opening hearts to your blessing. 
God, help us to realize that our children and young people are the church of today, not the future, as so many say, the church of today. Be with all those who are looking to serve at church holiday clubs and the fun, the learning, and the sense of belonging that brings to all who join in. Help us to trust in you and be led by you in everything we do. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. While I was getting uh, organized and doing some preparation for today, uh, I was reading the story uh, of Peter preaching at the home of Cornelius, and uh, he was telling them about Jesus. And it says uh, in Acts chapter 10, uh, verses 44 and 45, it says, While he was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell on everyone who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. What struck me it was the use of the word fell. The Holy Spirit fell on everyone who heard the word. I think that's important for a couple of reasons. I think it tells us that the Holy Spirit is the one who initiates communication and reaction. They didn't uh, try to, to jump up and grab it as some sort of power or charm because you, you can't do that. They weren't trying to work up some emotional frenzy. Peter was uh, still droning on. 
And maybe you should be praying for the Holy Spirit to come before I'm finished today. Fell. The Holy Spirit fell on them. Kind of means to, to rush or to press upon, to come suddenly upon, to, to cut down. And in other words, there's no disputing that Holy Spirit was present at that moment in that place. They could physically feel the presence of God with them. As I read uh, that story, my mind went to other places in the Bible where the power of God uh, fell. In First Chronicles uh, chapter uh, 21 and 26, David has been disobedient. He decided that he needed to count the number of people in Israel and the army, and God said that was just wrong. And so the whole nation was punished because of David's disobedience. And he was given the opportunity to present an offering to God. And as First Chronicles 21 and 26, it says, He, that is David, called on the Lord, and the Lord answered him with fire from heaven on the altar of burnt offering. Then later, Solomon is the one who builds the temple. Second Chronicles 7, 1 says, When Solomon finished praying, Fire fell down or came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests couldn't enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshipped and they gave thanks to the Lord saying, He is good and His love endures forever. These were undeniable, indisputable, irrefutable, visible, tangible manifestations of the power of God. But for me is one that stands out above the rest. And that is when Elijah squared off with Ahab and the false prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel. And you can read that story in 1 Kings chapter 18. The false prophets of Baal and Elijah, the man of God, came to this agreement. They would build an altar and they would offer sacrifice, but they wouldn't set fire to it. They would call on their God and whichever one set fire to the altar was the true God. So the prophets of Baal went first, and there were 400 of them. And they built their altar. And they began to pray, and nothing happened. And they prayed from morning until midday, and nothing happened. So Elijah began to get a wee bit cheeky. He started to go, what, is he sleeping? Maybe you need to shout louder. Maybe he's away for a walk. And, and he, he started to, to have a go at them. And nothing happened. And it says they beat themselves into a frenzy. They started to cut themselves. And nothing happened. And eventually, Elijah said, right, it's my turn. And he rebuilt the altar that had been torn down. The altar to God that had been torn down. And he got them to dig a trench around it. And he put the wood on and he put the bull on as the sacrifice. And then he said, now get me water. And they got 12 large <coughs> vessels for water and they poured it over the top of the sacrifice. And there was so much water that it filled the trench around about the sacrifice. What we sometimes forget about that is They'd had three years of drought. So that water was really precious. And it was poured out on the sacrifice. And Elijah didn't have to do anything other than say, Lord, come and show these people that you are God and there is no other. And it says the fire of God fell and consumed not only the sacrifice, but the wood and the stones for the altar. And it soaked up all of the water in the trench 
around it. And it says, when the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they worshipped God. There was no denying who was God and who was not God. Because the fire of God fell. They experienced a visible, tangible manifestation of the power of God. They had a God encounter. And then my mind goes to Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. The fire of God fell on David's altar and burnt offerings. The fire of God fell on Solomon's offering and sacrifice. The fire of God fell on the offering at Mount Carmel. Holy Ghost fire fell on the day of Pentecost. And Holy Ghost fire fell on the Gentiles in the home of Cornelius. And in every case, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, It was a visible, tangible, undeniable manifestation of the presence and the power of God. I wonder today if in the church in Scotland we have raised generations of Christians who have never had a God encounter. Who have never had that visible, physical, tangible experience of the presence of God. We know God in theory. We know God religiously. We know God mentally and intellectually. We know about God. But have we ever had a Mount Carmel day of Pentecost, house of Cornelius, encounter with the fire of the Holy Spirit falling on us? Have you ever had a burning bush experience? Have you ever experienced Holy Spirit seizing you, taking possession of you, so that you know, you know that it's God who is there? There can be no denying it. To so many people, I think in churches across Scotland, it's it's just an idea if it's ever talked about at all. We might mention Holy Spirit at Pentecost, but, well, you know. Holy Spirit is not the figment of an overactive imagination. Holy Spirit is not just religious ramblings of the mentally unstable. The fire of God is the Holy Spirit. He is the third person of the Godhead. He is God and he is the might and the power and the will of God. He is the same fire that fell on Mount Carmel, the same fire that fell on the day of Pentecost, the same fire that fell in Cornelius' house. He is real, tangible, alive, contagious. The power of God Holy Spirit can heal in ways that medicine can't. Doctors can treat cancer with surgery, with chemotherapy and radiotherapy. But the Holy Spirit can burn cancer out of your body and never leave a trace and with no harmful side effects. Holy Spirit can burn drugs out of your system and take the desire away all at the same time. Holy Spirit can deliver from alcohol, pornography, lust and greed He can burn up jealousy, pride, criticism, bitterness, and unforgiveness. He will heal your broken heart and restore your joy and peace. He can heal your marriage. He can heal your mind. And our prayer should be, send that fire today again on us. Let your fire fall. That same fire that fell on the day of Pentecost that same fire that fell on the house of Cornelius. Do it again. And just in case you think, I'm asking for something new. God has already sent revival in Cambus Lang, Orkney, Keith, Blair Gowrie, Edinburgh, Wick, 
Och, Cromarty, Dingwall, Kilsyth, and Lewis. This is nothing new. This is something that God longs to pour out on his people. This is something that, that as God's people, we should be praying for. We should be eagerly desiring. 1905, Charlotte Chapel, just along the road. The pastor, Joseph Kemp, went to Wales, and it says he brought back revival with him. He says, he writes, I spent two weeks watching, experiencing, drinking in, having my own heart searched, comparing my methods with those of the Holy Ghost, and then I returned to my people in Edinburgh to tell what I had seen. They began nightly meetings with conversions at every meeting. They are described as, as meetings of emotion and commotion. We want to do everything decently and in order. And you know, I, underst I understand that. But, but, have we for too long said we need to do things decently and in order? and actually block the work of the Holy Spirit in our congregations across the Church of Scotland. There was nothing, humanly speaking, to account for what happened. Quite suddenly, upon one another came an overwhelming sense of the reality and the awfulness of His presence and of eternal things. Life, death, and eternity seemed laid bare. Prayer and weeping began and gained in intensity every moment. Each seemed to sing and to pray oblivious of one another. And then the prayer broke out again. Waves and waves of prayer. And the midnight hour was reached. Didn't tell us when they started. But the midnight hour was reached. I find myself so often looking at the clock. The hours passed like minutes. It's useless being a spectator looking on or praying at it in order to catch its spirit and breath. It's necessary to be in it, praying in it, part of it, caught by the same power, swept by the same wind. These waves of revival were preceded by prayer, passionately expressed desire for the salvation of people was the dominant feature. There would often be simultaneous praying. The prayer meetings were as though held by invisible hands and were usually of a tumultuous sort. Imagine a tumultuous prayer meeting. I have them every Thursday morning <laughs> at seven o'clock when leaders across Edinburgh and Lothian gather for prayer. And if you're not up there speaking, as the, as the person before you says amen, you don't get in. And it's great. It's so good. And so... If God has done it before, do we genuinely believe that God can do it again? And if we do, what are we going to do about it? We can't, we can't force God's hand. We can't. But these times of renewal, of refreshing, of regeneration in history of Scotland came when people got together and were hungry for more of God. They wanted to see God come again, where they weren't just satisfied to read about it or sing about it. They wanted to experience God for themselves. Not just as a theory or a concept, but tangibly. The same power 
that divided the Red Sea, that caused water to flow out of a rock like a river. It's the same power that made three Hebrew children fireproof. It's the same power that, that gave Daniel's lion's lockjaw. It's the same power that shook Paul and Silas's prison and opened all the gates. It's the same power that was in Jesus' life that opened blind eyes, unstopped deaf ears, that made the lame walk and the dumb talk. It's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And it is available to you and to me today. That's God's promise for his people. God longs to pour out his spirit on his people. Matthew 5, he says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Matthew 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened. Jeremiah 33 and 3 Call to me, says God, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Hunger for God is a magnet. Hunger for God is what will draw anointing from God. Hunger for God will open the door for the manifestation of the power of God. Are we hungry? Are we really, truly, genuinely hungry for God and for all that he has for us? Do you want the power of God in your life? I hope so. My prayer is that we would be hungry. That in this place today, we would meet with God. Wherever there's an altar, wherever there's sacrifice, wherever there's prevailing prayer, wherever there are hungry hearts, wherever there's a desperation for him, God answers by his Spirit. I believe God is here today, here to save us, here to heal, here to deliver, to restore marriages, to heal your broken heart, to revive you, to put his fire back in you to give you a fresh anointing of his spirit, to set your heart and your life on fire for him. So what I would like to do is to ask you just where you are to pray. Just you and God. You don't even need to speak out. <laughs> just you and God. If you don't yet know God, ask him to reveal himself to you. If you do know God and you want more of him, ask him. Ask and you will receive. Seek and you'll find. Ask him, God, fill me again with your spirit. Tell him that you love him and that you want more of his presence with you. That you want whatever he has for you. And maybe if you are willing to do that as a sign that you are willing to receive whatever God's got for you, maybe you just want to hold out your hands because that's what we do when somebody offers us a gift. Just as a sign to say, yeah, I want you. So let's just, I'll be quiet for a moment too to let you pray.
And Father, you hear these silent prayers. You know what is in our hearts. And where there is that hunger for you, we pray that it would be satisfied. Where there is longing for you, will you meet that longing? Father, will you pour out your Spirit today? Not just as an idea or a concept. Not just as a nice thing. But will you pour out your Spirit to revive and renew, to heal and to restore, to give us dreams and visions, to fill us with passion and enthusiasm, to give us energy for the work that you've called us to do so that we can serve you, so that we can worship in spirit and in truth. Father, we know, we know that we cannot do this work in our own strength. We know that, as Andrew said earlier, it doesn't work when we do that. When you are not in us, when your spirit is not in us, it doesn't work. But when your spirit is in us, nothing's too hard. Nothing's too much. And so, Father, we pray again that you would pour out your spirit on us today. Maybe on somebody for the first time. Help them to know that it is you and give them the good gifts that you have for them. Father, maybe somebody today needs to be healed of something. And we pray that as you pour out your spirit, that healing might occur. Maybe somebody needs to be set free from something. And Father, we pray that as you pour out your Spirit, they might be set free. Because your Spirit is life. And with Him is life in all its fullness. Father, we thank you for what you've done in this place already and what you still have to do. Will you fall on our hearts, on our lives, on our relationships, on our ministries, on our visions and dreams, on our attitudes, on our families, our finances, on our minds, on all that we are, and will you take us, enabling us to worship and to serve? Amen. We are going to sing. It's a, it's a new it's song for the morning. But... Um, one of the pictures of, of the grace and the mercy and the Spirit of God uh, that we find in Scripture is that of a river. And there's a river that flows from the throne of God and out into the world. And alongside the river are trees and are the trees of life. And the, the, the kind of thinking is that you can, you can be standing by the, by the edge of the river and not experience the river. In order to experience it, you actually have to take that step into the river. And when they take the first step, it's just over the, their feet. And then they go a bit deeper and a bit deeper and a bit deeper. And last week, I was saying, do you know, we had a picture of, of um, 
It was Steph showed me a picture of whitewater rafting. And I was saying, I want to be whitewater rafting with God. I want to be in that river to the point where it's not my control anymore, but God is in control. I hope you do too. This song says, I'm going to the river. And it's an invitation for all of us to join together in it.
And so, as we go from this place, can I say, if you experience something of Holy Spirit, will you let us know? Will you tell somebody? Because that helps to make it real. And it's an encouragement to everybody else. But as you go, go with that fire, not from, not from what you've generated yourself, but a fire from God in you to love and to serve and to worship Him, to seek for transformation of our community and of ourselves. Go to love and serve Him. And as you go, may the grace of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go with you and those whom you love now and always. Amen. And sorry, if you would like prayer for anything specific, Elaine uh, and Elaine, two Elaines, who knew, are going to be uh, available at the front here if you would like prayer for anything uh, today.